Testing. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, everyone, and welcome. It's so great to be gathering here at the Milton Public Library. I first just want to start off um, by thanking Milton for Peace for bringing us together. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you so much for all the work that's gone into this evening. I know it's been a lot of planning, and it's so important for us to come together uh, as a community to uh, understand what's going on with this complex issue. My name is Jenny Mulqueen, and I am involved with the Milton Changemakers, which is a coalition group that is steered a lot by Milton for Peace. And we, um, we are a group that uh, really works to educate each other. And that's what we're here to do tonight. I'm also really excited as a mom of a high schooler um, to welcome the Amnesty Club from Milton High School, who will really be guiding us this evening. We'll be starting with um, introductions by our the Amnesty Club of our speakers, um, who will speak each for about 15 minutes. And then we will move into uh, a period where they will be asking questions of each other. Uh, during that time, and, and really any time, you can indicate that you have a question. And uh, we will be collecting those questions. The Amnesty Club students will be uh, bringing you a piece of paper to fill out and ask that question. And we will do our best to get to all of those questions at the end. We do have limited time. So um, very um, scheduled event here, very organized. Um, <clears throat> another um, plug is we have a mailing list uh, for Milton for Peace over in the corner. If you'd like to uh, really keep up to date with what's happening in town with Milton for Peace. Um, I know that they have historically done these forums. I'm so excited that they're doing them again. And uh, we'd like to see more of that. Art promises just one email a month. So um, you're not signing up to be deluged. Um, so without further ado, I want to bring up um, our first Amnesty student, who is the, um, let's see, you told me, the secretary? No, just a member, but, but our first speaker, Oliver Jones, who is going to start us off this evening by introducing our first speaker. Oh. Um, our first speaker tonight is Joseph Gerson. Um, he's the president of the Campaign for Peace, Disarmament, and Common Security. He's also co-governor uh, of the Peace and Planet International Network and co-founder of the Committee for Sane China. Could you just speak a little yeah, bit? Sorry. Yeah, there we go. Um, he's also co-founder of the Committee for a Sane China Policy. He works closely with Asian and European peace and nuclear disarmament movements and is frequently frequently a keynote speaker at the World Conference Against A and H Bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki and other international and US forums. He is a PhD in politics and international security studies and is the author of three books and many articles about US nuclear weapon policies and the history of their use. His most recent book is Empire and the Bomb, how the US nuclear weapons, how the US uses nuclear weapons to dominate the world. He was formerly director of the American Friends Service Committee's Peace and Economic Security Program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. Um, first of all, just to say that um, uh, with the high school students here, it brought back my memories of being in high school uh, with the United Nations Club and uh, wandering uh, up and down Massachusetts Avenue in Washington to go from one embassy to the next to try to get their positions on on various uh, uh, issues of the time. Uh, in starting, I just want to kind of bring back a memory, uh, appreciation of Milton for peace and remembering Gerda Conant, who played a leading role here many years ago. And uh, just to just to, to appreciate that, uh, I'm going to try and do with my want. I'm going to try and do too much in too little time. 
Um, as the first speaker, I need to kind of lay out a little bit of the foundation, a little bit of the history here. Uh, then I want to explain why time is not on Ukraine's side. Uh, I want to uh, talk about the context in terms of the post-Cold War era that we're in. And I was asked to talk about what I've been hearing uh, from people I speak to in Europe uh, and, and East Asia. Uh, and I'll try and get as much of that in as I can. And then we have that delightful 15-minute Q&A period and, and others so we can go more deeply into it. I shall start by saying that um, uh, obviously uh, Putin's invasion of Ukraine uh, has to be condemned. I mean, a, a brutal violation of international law uh, when there were, among other things, diplomatic roads that were open even for his uh, ambition. Um, but time is not on Ukraine's side. Uh, and it's in not only Ukraine's interest, but in the United States' interest to be pushing now as hard as we can for a ceasefire. Um, we're not going to articulate exactly what will come out of that or how it will be formed. We can talk about that a bit more later. Uh, my timer is not working here. Um, okay, then um, I meant to say that the $54 billion, uh, that had just been passed by by the European Union, uh, it's not, it, it'll hold, it'll, it'll keep Ukraine afloat. Its economy has just gone, excuse me, to hell. Uh, it'll pay the um, uh, salaries of teachers and others for about four years, uh, but it's not going to give Ukraine the kind of military uh, support that it needs. Um, ultimately, uh, I think they're going to need to be three, three dimensions of inter interrelated negotiations. On the one hand, between Ukraine and Russia, that'll have to be facilitated by, by other forces, other countries, maybe the Pope. Uh, there'll need to be a NATO-Russia set of negotiations uh, about the European security architecture. Uh, and there's going to need to be, obviously, uh, U.S. and um, Russian negotiations in terms of the foundations of international strategic stability, including nuclear weapons. And all three of those are uh, interrelated. It'll be interesting to see if and how that plays out. Let me say why time is not on Ukraine's side. Uh, first of all, its population size, uh, its economy, its military industry are all quite small compared to Russia's. Uh, Russia's, Russia's, Russia's economy is only one-tenth that of China's. So we're talking about something which is is, uh, is relatively small. Uh, we've got increased war fatigue, uh, not only uh, in the United States, uh, but in Ukraine as well. Uh, people are not signing up to join the military. Uh, they're talking about a new conscription law. Uh, people are tired. Um, we've got divisions in leadership now in Ukraine. It's, you know, some time ago, the General Milley here uh, said that there's no military solution. Uh, this has apparently dawned on the um, Ukrainian uh, top military leader, uh, Zelensky, uh, and he's actually more popular at the moment than Zelensky, but about to be fired. Uh, and so you've got those political tensions within Ukraine as well. Uh, Ukraine has lost tremendous numbers of soldiers, uh, not only its, its uh, civilians, but huge military losses uh, with a population that's, what, one-fourth the size of Russia's. It's not a great um, set of, of uh, uh, physics uh, numbers that in their, in their, in their benefit. Uh, we also need to remember that uh, we still do face a very dangerous situation, uh, even as our focus at the moment is the genocide in Gaza uh, and the widening war in the Middle East. Uh, there's the possibility uh, of either horizontal, uh, being geographic, uh, or vertical, meaning up the ladder of devastation, including nuclear, could still emerge, uh, although I think it's 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 less likely. Uh, let me talk a bit about why Ukraine is, oh, how do I get rid of this thing here? I wanted to show you the map of Ukraine, if some, somebody can help me here. Red button. The red button, back to, okay. got it. Nope, nope. it's not safe. Sorry. Okay, so why is Ukraine important? Uh, it's flat. Uh, it's been the basic invasion route uh, from across Europe, especially from Germany uh, to to Russia, uh, and that's that's a geographical reality that just endures. 
Um, we have the history of Eastern Ukraine uh, being deeply integrated uh, with, with initially the Soviet Union and then uh, with Russia, uh, economically, uh, industrially, uh, and linguistically as, as well, religiously as well. Um, we have the reality that going back to, um, you know, just to say there was an article in the Times on the weekend uh, about the, the uh, Israel-Palestine conflict. And it begins by saying, where should we start in terms of chronologically? It decided the 1920s. When we're looking at this at this war, the question is, where do we want to start? Uh, every side has got its its, its time. Uh, many in Russia will go back to the year 988, uh, when Kiev in Russia was created, uh, the origin of the Russian state, uh, and when the leader of uh, Kiev in Rus uh, basically converted to Russian Orthodoxy. Uh, unknown here is that in the 1400s, Ukraine was a province of the Polish and, believe it or not, the Lithuanian Empire. Uh, and what you have out of all this is a division in terms of language and religion. Uh, so that in Western Ukraine, people are uh, more Western-oriented, they're more Catholic than, 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 than Orthodox, uh, and very different traditions. We have uh, the history of Crimea, right? Uh, taken over by Catherine the Great in, what, 1783 or so? Uh, as the warm water port central to Russian uh, influence uh, going south and, and, and its, um, its security, uh, the home of the Russian uh, uh, let's see, Black Sea Fleet, and so on. Uh, prior to World War I, I've just been working my way through a really dense history of the Habsburg Empire, worth knowing about. Uh, and during the Habsburg Empire, uh, basically, Ukraine was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, right? Uh, and only really became independent uh, briefly uh, in 1918. Uh, that ended in 1919 when the uh, when the Soviets took over. Uh, when I was in college, I had this. I went to Georgetown. I had this crazy professor, uh, a priest, uh, as anti-communist as you could imagine. Uh, it turned out, I learned later, he was Joe McCarthy's father confessor. Why was he so hard right? He had been a missionary in Ukraine during Stalin's um, uh, collectivization when millions of Ukrainians died uh, and, of a famine. Uh, and so you've got these deep, deep historical uh, memories at the play. Uh, and then we have the, um, the reality, uh, you know, Khrushchev uh, making the administrative uh, allocation of uh, Ukraine to Soviet Union, of Russia, uh, and then we have the post Cold War period uh, in which we had a competition between the East and the West for control. Um, fundamental to the Russian perspective here, and I'll go into it in more detail, uh, is the, the strategic vulnerability that they felt with Ukraine's deepening integration in, into, into NATO. Uh, remember that Russia suffered from the uh, invasion by Germany under the Kaiser, uh, under before that, Napoleon, uh, and then after that, by Hitler. Uh, so deep in the Russian worldview is this fear of invasion from the West across across Ukraine. Um, it's also worth, as we go into, in, into the current situation, uh, to, to look at some of the complexities here. Um, uh, you know, when I went to Georgetown, one of my classmates was this guy named Bill Clinton. And and uh, you watch his career. Uh, and in 1999, he made a fundamental mistake, uh, which was to commit to the expansion of NATO. Uh, having, I mean, he he, he took Father Fadner's course too. Uh, he should have been aware of what this meant for, for, for the Russians. Uh, and so you have with that the basic violation of what had been a common security order in the immediate post, post in the immediate uh, post Cold War order, you had the thing. Lots of things here if you look up and, and look, learn about, right? So you had the Paris Charter, uh, and you had the uh, NATO Russia founding document, right? And in both of those, there's a commitment that no country on either side will take any measures to improve its security at the expense of the other. In fact, that had been the foundation for the end of the Cold War. That's how you got to the INF Treaty uh, two years before before Russia collapsed. Uh, so you have a situation in which Clinton is basically shattering uh, what had been 
a, a, a much more peaceful order, uh, thinking Russia is weak and we can just uh, have a great influence across Eurasia uh, as we want. Um, the Russians, you know, were kind of too weak. Uh, Putin's ambition was to rebuild the empire. Uh, and, you know, there's lots of debates back and forth, but it's worth noting uh, that, um, remember, the, the, the intentions as we're building in, in 2022, or 2021, I guess, um, and the Russians put forward a draft treaty to the United States for diplomacy. Uh, that draft treaty basically called for rolling back much of the expansion of NATO. It was it was not going to be accepted, uh, and and, uh, and 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 on we on we go. Um, what's at stake at the moment, as I mentioned before, uh, in part, uh, is the architecture, the European security architecture, uh, and uh, it's going to change, uh, especially as Ukraine uh, is not taking advantage of the time that it has. Um, I'm going to say it here. Uh, you know, the question here is, will Ukraine be part of the West? And if so, uh, it's, it's going too fast. Um, <laughs> so we're going to have to go to looking at the at the international, international uh, what I'm hearing in, in Q&A period. Um, what do I want to do with this? Yeah, so... Um, I think we need to, on, on the one hand, uh, recognize I, I'm in part of a unusual thing. Uh, so many of you used to watch Sesame Street, and you know the routine where they go, well, which one of these is not the same? Uh, so I got invited in about, I don't know, December or so to be part of a track two process. Uh, track two is sort of unofficial uh, uh, discussions between uh, apparently, senior leaders usually out of office uh, uh, to across borders, across tensions, uh, to talk about what might be possible. Uh, people in these discussions are confidential. I can't even say who's in them. I can't quote them. Uh, some of these people are Russian generals, American generals, diplomats who have negotiated with one another uh, over time. Uh, and just a couple of things to, to point out from that. Uh, one is that... Um, Early, there's a basic, you could feel the division. I, 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 some of them are even more criminals. Uh, one of the things that you um, could discern in the first months of the war was divisions in the Russian elite. Uh, so you had, on the one hand, uh, Putin's hardliners, and on the other, a number of the figures who are in this track two process who sought early on to try to, with their with colleagues that they had negotiated with before on the other side of the line, uh, to try to find a way to prevent the war, to extend the policies. Uh, and then after that, what you've seen is efforts to contain it, uh, to try to find a foundation for what can be negotiated peace. Uh, and also, as they get more hopeless, frankly, uh, looking at... I think it's uh, looking at looking at what, what will be the post-war foundation. What where are the openings for negotiations? I mean, we're in a very dangerous situation here, where the entire architecture of nuclear disarmament of the uh, really since the Kennedy administration is in total collapse. It's not there, uh, and what we're looking at with the um, will be the the um, expiration of the New Start nuclear deal that, that Obama got through, um, we're looking at the, at the probability, actually, of an unrestrained nuclear arms race, more complicated now because you've got China in, in it as well. So we're looking at that very, very uh, dangerous situation. Uh, and these, these people have largely been looking at that and also talking about what will the, what will the, what are the possibilities for new architecture be? Uh, talking about what does it mean with uh, uh, Finland, and uh, Sweden now in NATO. Uh, just to say, one of the things that you hear in this discussion, come back to it later with my time limits here, uh, the Russians are, what we're hearing is that 95% of Russia's conventional military forces are concentrated in Ukraine. Uh, they uh, are in no position anytime soon uh, to be uh, launching an invasion of other uh, European or NATO countries. Um, what we see is that with the 
obvious failures, and someone's going to tell me when I have to shut up. With the obvious, with the obvious failures of its of its conventional forces in Ukraine, Russia is going to be much more uh, dependent on its nuclear weapons as its perceived defense against the West and the threats of the West. Um, and you know, we, we're, we're such nice people here in the United States. We've just opened a, a wide war across much of the Middle East. And the last thing I'll say before we go here. Uh, is that um, I want to recommend a book which is, uh, in, in theory, has nothing to do with what I'm talking about here. Um, uh, it's, it's Rachel Maddow's new book, Prequel. And it talks about the um, rise of fascism here in the United States in the 20s and 30s, uh, how strong the neo Nazi forces were, what they meant, and also penetration of other, other countries, especially Germany, uh, in our domestic politics at the time. Uh, it's worth knowing, well, knowing because it has more than a few parallels uh, for for today. The last thing I'll say before I shut up here is that uh, I'll come back to it later. I guess uh, is that um, uh, the the future of the world, the future of this war, uh, depends not a little bit on the outcome of the 2024 election. Uh, and as you talk to people in Europe, uh, especially those. Uh, anyone really, uh, uncertainty of what a Trump victory would mean uh, in terms of pulling the plug on NATO uh, and what that means for the, for the whole world order. So I'll just, uh, having maybe um, stepped on a few toes, uh, maybe piqued a little bit of interest, I'm going to uh, turn over the floor to George Beebe uh, and uh, uh, look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. So next I'm going to call up Griffin Angus from the Amnesty Club. He is the vice president and the secretary. So come on up, Griffin. Our next speaker is George Beebe. Uh, he is the director of grand strategy at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. He spent more than two decades in government as an intelligence analyst, diplomat, and policy advisor, including as director of the CIA's Russia Analysis, director of the CIA's Open Source Center, and as a staff advisor on Russian matters to Vice President Cheney. His book, The Russia Trap, How Our Shadow War with Russia Could Spiral into Nuclear Catastrophe, warned how the United States and Russia could stumble into a dangerous military confrontation. Prior to joining the Quincy Institute, George was a vice president and director of studies for the, at the Center for the National Interest. He speaks Russian and German. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Can you all hear me and see me all right? <laughs> We're getting rid of the map here. Okay. Oh, oh, you did, huh? Let me see. Stop sharing. Stop sharing? Okay. Right there, the right one. Yes. Okay. Um, there we go. Very good. Everyone can, can hear and see now? Yes. Great. Well, thank you again for that introduction. Thank you for the invitation to speak to you all tonight. I wish I could be there in person. Unfortunately, I am uh, here in the greater Washington, D.C. area, which has some advantages, but uh, is uh, nowhere near as hospitable a place as Massachusetts. Um, I uh, actually spent many years there as a child growing up, so I, I uh, I, I not only wish I was at this event, I wish I could be up there uh, and, and seeing friends and family as well. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the view of this war from Washington, uh, what the, uh, the conventional Washington wisdom is right now, 
and what kind of room for maneuver the, the United States might have. Uh, I endorse uh, everything that uh, Joe Gerson had said about uh, the state of this war, the, the, uh, the fact that time is not on Ukraine's side right now and, the, and that the U.S. is going to have to shift to a new approach or uh, present trends are going to lead to a much worse outcome from, uh, for Ukraine. Um, so a couple of points. Number one, um, Washington recognizes, the Biden administration recognizes, Congress recognizes um, that Ukraine is in a very difficult position right now. And, and they tend to speak in euphemisms about this, but the, the phrases that you hear in Washington are, you know, 2024 is going to be a very difficult year for the Ukrainians. But they are, they are quick to add, if we can get through this year, if Ukraine can make it through this year, then the picture will start to brighten. Uh, why? Well, the hope is that um, eventually uh, the West, the United States and Europe, can begin manufacturing uh, weapons that the Ukrainians need in sufficient volumes that they can contend with Russia's numerical advantages in this war. Now, what has happened since the war began almost exactly two years ago, the Russians tried essentially a quick blitzkrieg maneuver. They tried to surprise the Ukrainians, parachute into Kiev, launch a multi-pronged offensive along axes in the north, the east, and the south, and quickly over, overwhelm the Ukrainians and force them essentially to, to concede in some way. That failed. Uh, it was a poorly planned operation. The Russians suffered from a number of, of self-inflicted problems, and they weren't able to seize Kyiv, the Ukrainian capital, and they had to regroup and refocus their war effort largely on the east and the south of Ukraine, where they made you know, modest progress over the course of the first few months of the war, but not what uh, Putin or his uh, general staff had hoped for. Then the war shifted um, and Ukraine was able to exploit some advantages that it had. It was getting uh, very accurate, real-time intelligence, both from its own drones, but even more from the United States and Europe, that helped them pinpoint where Russian forces were and exploit weaknesses in Russian lines. And we also provided high precision weaponry, guided munitions that allowed the Ukrainians quickly to strike those uh, opportunities. And that produced some rather spectacular breakthroughs in the second half of 2022. The Ukrainians were able to recover a couple of large cities and a lot of land that the Russians had initially captured and occupied. And by the, the winter of 2022, I think Ukraine had clear momentum in the war and there was a lot of optimism in Washington that the Ukrainians might actually pull off a, a David versus Goliath kind of victory, that they could use intelligence and high technology weaponry to um, outmaneuver the Russians on the battlefield. The Russians then adapted. Uh, Putin recognized that he had a problem. He didn't want to have to uh, call up Russian reserves and, and mobilize bigger portions of the Russian population. But his choice was either to do that or to face some pretty steep uh, odds on the battlefield. So. He launched what was called a partial mobilization. He called up over 300,000 uh, Russian forces to supplement his initial invasion force. He put Russian industry on a war footing. So they started churning out vast numbers of artillery shells and tanks and missiles and, and other weapons at a much greater rate than what the United States and its uh, Western allies could produce. And Russian forces dug in on the battlefield. They built a multi-echelon defensive lines with mines and tank traps and ditches and reinforced underground shelters. 
that made it very difficult for the Ukrainians to make uh, advances into the teeth of that defense. And the Russians launched wave after wave of, of missile and drone strikes against Ukraine, which did some damage to the Ukrainians, but more important, they used up Ukraine's reserves of air defense missiles and air defense artillery. So over time, um, the Russians were succeeding in a strategy of attrition against Ukraine. They were taking advantage of their much greater population, their much greater military industry uh, capacity, and hoping that the Ukrainians would run out of men, run out of uh, munitions, and the West would run out of patience over time. Um, and that is what is happening right now. I think, as, as Joe quite accurately said, um, the momentum, momentum in the war is on Russia's side. Now, um, how is the West responding to this? How is Washington responding to this? Uh, the Biden administration understands those facts pretty well. What they're saying is, OK, uh, Ukraine needs to shift to a defensive strategy. Instead of hoping to win this war by going on offense and breaking through the Ukrainian lines and forcing the Russians to, to sue for peace, the strategy now seems to be let's hold the lines in place, either halt or slow Russian uh, offensive advan advances, and eventually convince Putin that um, actually winning this war outright, gaining additional territory is a very costly, if not futile endeavor, and that Russia ought to think about uh, coming to the negotiating table and, and finding a way of ending this war. We want to show Putin that time is not on his side. Um, third point, um, this war has become a domestic political issue in Washington. Um, we're in an election year, as everybody knows, there are big differences between uh, what the leading Republican candidate, uh, Donald Trump, is saying about Ukraine. He's saying, look, you know, we need to end this war. And if I'm elected, I'll end this war within 24 hours. Stark contrast with where Biden has been. Um, and uh, under these circumstances, uh, the Republicans don't want to indulge the Biden administration's request for almost $62 billion in, in new uh, aid to Ukraine, what that would effectively do, and this is not coincidental, is extend uh, any Ukrainian request for more aid past that November election. Um, so, uh, that's where Biden wants to be. They essentially want to put this war on hold, freeze the lines in place until after November, um, after which either they will be in uh, a more flexible place politically with which to deal with Russia, uh, or it won't be their problem. It will be whoever else is elected at that time. Um, now, Will that strategy work? My guess is probably not. Number one, uh, because this has become a domestic political issue in the United States, there's little hope uh, that, in my view, that Congress is going to agree to a very large, you know, $60 billion uh, assistance package for the Ukrainians. They'll probably agree to something, but uh, small, small, uh, a much smaller uh, scale of aid. Um, and the other problem is uh, not only is time not on uh, Ukraine's side, but uh, Putin himself is facing an election uh, this March, which everybody believes he's going to win. But how he wins it and how convincing that election is uh, in for Russians matters. It's not just uh, can Putin win uh, another term in office, it's can he win in a way that gives him sufficient clout within the Russian political elite to manage this war as he sees fit and take Russia into what will eventually be a post-Putin era in a smooth and managed way that he uh, guides. Um, so that means that Putin um, is 
you know, probably not going to be in a negotiating mood between now and his uh, re-election in March. But thereafter, he'll be in an interesting position. Um, it's likely that Russia's momentum will have grown even more by that point. Uh, spring will bring opportunities for more advances on the ground in Ukraine. Ukraine will be that much more depleted of military forces. And you know, the picture of Western assistance to Ukraine will be even a little clearer at that point and probably won't be good news from the Ukrainian side. So um, that's where the question comes in. Does the United States have an option other than to try to freeze this war into place? Could we advance a negotiating strategy, a diplomatic offensive, so to speak? to try to incentivize the Russians to end this war, not capitulate. The Russians are not going to capitulate. They're not going to give up uh, their key objectives in this war. There's no battlefield reason for them to do that right now. But Putin is likely to have his eye on bigger things than just where the lines are drawn on the battlefield in Ukraine. He wants to secure Russia's place in the world, uh, not just under his own rule, but, but forever, whoever succeeds him thereafter. And he, um, as a result of this inv invasion, has more or less maneuvered Russia into a corner uh, internationally. Um, Russia has no relationship, so to speak, with the United States or Europe. That has left it largely dependent on China and the global south. And that's not a very good place for Russia to be in. It means there are real limits on its potential economic growth. It means that he's going to have to deal with a very volatile, a very hostile line of confrontation with the United States and NATO in Europe. Um, that will drain Russia of resources over time um, and really interfere with its ability to develop its civilian economy over time. Um, so can Russia solve those problems by winning, quote unquote, in Ukraine? My answer is no, it can't. Um, it can certainly uh, occupy land that it has claimed, which it, is, it has officially annexed, but doesn't yet militarily occupy. It can probably ensure that Ukraine is in no condition to join NATO, which is one of its key objectives at the beginning of this invasion. But it can't secure its place in the West. It can't protect itself against the threat of uh, escalation into conflict with NATO over time because you know, the kind of Cold War mechanisms that once ensured that the Cold War would remain cold um, aren't possible under these circumstances. The, the West and, and Russia just aren't even talking to each other. So I think these circumstances mean that there are incentives for Russia to seek a settlement here. Washington does have alternatives other than just trying to shovel more more weaponry to Ukraine and hoping they can hold the Russians off. Um, and if we are able to move toward a, a, a sensible uh, diplomatic strategy, I think there are ways that the United States can secure Ukraine's independence, protect Europe and um, also um, mitigate the dangers of escalation into broader conflict with Russia uh, and beyond moving forward. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll leave, I'll leave it, it at that and we can address, address any questions, questions you might have later. later. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. I am now going to uh, bring up Elsie Caldwell, who is the co-president of the Amnesty Club to introduce our third and final speaker. Thank you. Hello. Oh, um, I will be introducing Paul Shannon. Paul Shannon is on the executive committee of Massachusetts Peace Action and is the chair of their Ukraine campaign, Ukraine, A Time for Peace. He is a teacher, writer, organizer, and co-author of the book, Chomsky for Activists. 
Born in Boston, Paul has been an activist, writer, and speaker in various peace, union, prison reform, human rights, and social justice movements, particularly the United Farm Workers Union Drives, the Vietnam Anti-War and Solidarity Movements, the movement to end apartheid in South Africa, the 1980s Central American and Cambodian Solidarity Movements, the Haitian Solidarity Movement, and the Afghanistan and Iraqi anti-war movements. He is a past editor of the Indochina newsletter and was director of the National Film Library of the New England American Friends Service Committee and was part of its Peace and Economic Security Program. Thank you, Elsie. You're welcome. Where did you find all that? <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you. Um, the other, the other oh, one. the other tab. Sorry. Sorry. There you go. It's good. The other one. So thank you to, to Elsie, but also to all the other students here tonight for being part of this event. Uh, it's, it's great to see students interested in Ukraine giving everything else that's going on in their lives and in the country and the world. In talking about the title of tonight's talk, How to Get Peace in Ukraine, I think we have to admit that we have to know something about what the war is about if we want it to end. But this is virtually impossible in the United States. I'd like to just call to mind Mark Twain's quote that uh, Ambassador Chaz Freeman, Freeman uh, quotes in one of his recent publications. The researches of many commentators have already thrown much darkness on this subject. And it is probable that if they continue, we shall soon know nothing at all about it. In my short period of time here, although it may seem long to you, uh, I want to touch on some key developments that lie behind why this war is happening in the hope that it will help us understand a little bit about what we can do to help end it. We think the story of Russia's invasion of Ukraine starts just two years ago, February 24th, 2022. Seems like a lot longer. <laughs> but actually, the story of the Russian invasion of Ukraine on Fe February 24th, 2022, um, that war actually started 27 years ago. Before it started back then, in 1990, the administration of President George Bush Sr. had promised to the head of the Soviet Union, Mr. Gorbachev, that because he agreed to totally dismantle the Warsaw Pact, the various countries, including some of those in the map here, and let them go their own way, an amazing historical development, something that it would be nice if other empires decided to do, that if Gorbachev and Russia allowed, at that time the Soviet Union, soon to be Russia, if it allowed NATO to expand into all of Germany, that that would be it. That NATO would not expand one inch to the east toward Russia. Well, Germany is quite a, dis quite a good distance from Russia. From Russia. But why did the U.S. feel it had to make that promise to Gorbachev? The reason, of course, 
is that Russia would feel threatened if this Western alliance moved its move toward the Russian border. This makes perfect sense. Well, after that, of course, the Soviet Union ended, a guy named Yeltsin took over Russia. Our advisors streamed in, telling them to privatize everything. The, uh, the billionaires in Russia, at that time only millionaires, took over, bought every piece of public property at a nickel on the dollar, and Russia collapsed. The life expectancy dropped dramatically. Poverty increased dramatically. And Russia was prostate. It posed no threat whatsoever to any other country, and certainly not to the Western European countries. And yet, in the 1990s, as, this, as Russia was falling apart, the decision was made to expand NATO toward Russia. And in 1970, 1997, which I'm putting as the beginning of this war, that expansion started by leaps and bounds. I forget how many, Joe knows how many countries joined NATO over that period, between that period and 2021. Dozens, almost a couple of dozen. In 2000, a guy named Putin was appointed by Yeltsin to run the government because Putin was having all kinds of health problems. And at first, the U.S. assumed that Putin would follow the same policies as Yeltsin. Remember, we had won the election in 1996 for Boris Yeltsin. Clinton actually won that. Like, look at Time magazine. Yanks to the rescue, front page, Boris Yeltsin. The U.S. won this election for him. Not that we would interfere in anyone else's election. Putin comes in, and instead of going along with Yeltsin's policies, develops a much more independent policy, and, what, and Russia starts to recover. As that happens, Putin, because of his own behaviors in Russia, and but mainly because of what's going on in the United States, he becomes, by 2004, the enemy of the United States. And that continues, that, that relationship continues to grow. I would just recommend, by the way, if people want to understand this, these Putin years, uh, Professor Stephen Cohen's book, War with Russia. Who, Cohen unfortunately died as the war was beginning, uh, but there's a lot of background there that we do not know. In 2007, Putin tells the West, tells NATO, what are you doing? You promised us that you wouldn't expand to the East. An inch. You expanded to the East hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles. In 2008, the United States, uh, NATO rather, declares that Ukraine will be part of NATO. Ukraine, as you saw in this map, is right on Russia's border. Russia feels betrayed. The agreement has been broken. The United States starts pouring billions of dollars of money in military, but mainly uh, National Endowment for Democracy money into Ukraine. 2014 comes along. The elected president of Ukraine is expected to sign a deal to bring Ukraine into the European Union, not NATO, but the European Union. There is one thing that happened before this that I, I don't think many people are aware of. That, well, Gorbachev and the Bush administration were negotiating. 
This country called Ukraine declared its independence. Certainly an event that I wasn't paying any attention to. And in its basic core law, Ukraine states, the Ukrainian Republic declares its intention of becoming a permanently neutral state that does not participate in any military blocks. And it goes on and says, we will also not become a, a nuclear power. And yet in 2008, the United States says Ukraine will become part of NATO, even though the Ukrainian core law says it can't. You saw that map, Western Ukraine and Eastern Ukraine, in some ways different worlds. In Western Ukraine, there's a tremendous desire to join the EU. And when the elected president goes to meet with the EU and does not come home with an agreement to join, but is putting off that agreement, people in Western Ukraine go bananas. And there is a huge uprising no doubt enabled and supported, but primarily a popular uprising by Western Ukrainians, uh, funded, a lot of their organization is funded by our National Endowment for Democracy. We, we Between uh, 2008 and 2014, we poured $5 billion into Ukraine. And there was this Maidan uprising, peaceful, Huge numbers in the streets. At that time, let me get, let me get the facts straight now. Europeans come into the scene to try to negotiate some type of deal to undermine, to get rid of this political disaster that's kind of going on. The government is paralyzed. And they come up with an agreement, and the president agrees that elections will be moved up a year, a couple of years, actually, to the next year, 2015. This is in 2014, all this is going on. No sooner had that deal by uh, Germany and some of the other countries been worked out, than all of a sudden there were shootings in the street. In our press, it was covered as the police of the Ukrainian government firing on the protesters. So a lot of controversy about it, an interesting story in itself. Rather than accepting the new agreement, the United States, through uh, Victoria Newland, you know, everyone probably has heard of the phone call of Newland talking about that we are going to help overthrow this government. We're going to um, make sure that certain people are in power and all this type of stuff. And Biden is on board. Within two weeks of that call, it was intercepted probably by Russian sources, who knows. Instead of this political agreement going into effect, rather, there is a coup. And the right wing, the ultra right wing in Ukraine takes over the buildings, the government buildings, chases the president away. Biden tells Yanukovych, the president, you should leave. Within one day, the United States recognizes that coup government that has overthrown the elected government of Ukraine. Russia is freaked out because it knows that the forces that have just taken over hate Russia. Many of them are neo-Nazis who have an ideology to, that the Russians are inferior, Slavs, or whatever, <laughs> whatever the ideology was at that time, have to be destroyed. The new government it passes laws to prevent Russia from being the official language in uh, eastern areas of Ukraine. And there is riots and killings the most famous famous one being in Odessa, where the new where people supportive of the new government burned to death several dozen or more uh, people opposing the coup. 
Russian speakers. And in response to this felt attack, people in the far eastern Ukraine, in Donetsk and Luhansk, declare independent republics. Russia goes in, seizes Crimea. Saw that on the nice map that Joe had for us. Crimea is the main Russian military base in that whole area. And Russia knew that as soon as this coup, this new government that has overthrown the elected government comes in, that they will hand that base over to NATO. And so Russia seizes Crimea and starts supporting the separatists in Donetsk and Luhansk. A vicious war ensues in April of 2014. The government, the new government of Ukraine, declares a terrorist operation against the people, their own citizens, in Ukraine and in, uh, Donetsk and Luhansk. And they invade the area, try to take it back. As I said, Russia supports the separatists. They're not really separatists. They're people who are saying, you just overthrew our elected government. <laughs> we elected this government. And now you're coming after us. And we're going to fight you. And a terrible war happens. 14,000 people killed. Ukraine is thrown into civil war. And this continues until 2021, 2022. How much time do I have left, by the way? I don't know. Stop. People are familiar with the invasion in February 2022. Just before that invasion, Russia had tried to get the United States to negotiate a solution to this crisis, where they knew that with, the United States was insisting that Western powers and the military would, on, would be on Russia's border. The United States wouldn't even talk to them. Russia invades. Immediately, almost, negotiations start up between Ukraine and Russia. And a deal, a draft, is agreed upon. Zelensky says, we got a deal. It involves, we will be neutral, and Russia will, troops will leave. And the people in Donetsk and Luhansk will have the chance to have uh, autonomy. This would have left Ukraine, except for Crimea, intact. The United States told Zelensky, don't you dare sign that. If you do, you're no friend of ours. We will not support you if you do that. Zelensky withdraws that agreement that would have left Ukraine intact if followed out. And we're off and running with the war. What is the solution to this? First of all, let me just give you my prejudiced point of view. Did uh, in 2021, the United States and Russia and Ukraine, by the way, signed a strategic agreement, military, political, economic, in which they would be strategic partners. Forget about NATO. This was a move to the United States taking over the military situation in Ukraine. If anyone wants to read the agreement, I have it here. Very dangerous. As soon as Russia sees this, I mean, this is this is right on our doorstep. The U.S. is here. It's training ten thousand Ukrainian troops a year. It's it's uh, service personnel are here already, and they say they are going to fight with Ukraine to keep to uh, force us out of the Crimea and to stop us from supporting the republics in Donetsk. I think it's pretty clear. We ask, I'll ask questions about what the goals of Russia are. Is it a, a imperial claim to try to take over Ukraine, or is it a, def a defensive move to protect its national security? My own sense is that U.S. goals were, first of all, and I think they're very clear, to weaken Russia, 
to use this situation, the expansion of NATO, and then the involvement of all this involvement in Ukraine to weaken Russia and eventually to overthrow its government. I think to me, that's crystal clear. But our other speakers may probably disagree with that as well as some of you, that's fine. Regardless of how we look at it now, there are two alternatives that we've just mentioned. One is a stalemate where the war will go on for 10 years. The problem is Russia, I mean, Ukraine won't have any men left after 10 years. Russians, Ukrainians have suffered 400,000 ca military casualties already. They are going to have to implement a 500,000 man draft to get people who are not even trained to do military activity. They are going to be slaughtered. Whether they have a cease, have, have a, uh, are able to hold on to the situation or not. The other option, of course, is that Russia militarily keeps pushing to the West and keeps on taking over more and more parts of Ukraine. Both of these options are disasters for Ukraine. The pre at the present situation in the past, Ukraine had such a much better opportunity to preserve its independence. All it had to do was say, we will, not, we will follow our old constitution and be neutral. And that would have done it. Now the situation for Ukraine is very desperate. And the, the losses are astronomical. This is something, whether you support Ukraine, whether you think Russia is justified and all this type of stuff, can Russia be justified in its invasion, even if it is essential to protecting itself from being overthrown by a foreign military power? No, because the United Nations Charter prevents that. It says it's, an, it's illegal to do that. You can't just on the basis of being threatened invade another country, never mind to do everything else that's been done as Ukraine has been, you know, so destroyed in so many ways. But right now we have to decide where we go. Mass peace action is urging everyone to support the idea of a ceasefire and negotiations. Joe and, uh, and George mentioned the difficulties of that. Will Putin ever do agree with that? That is not the issue. Putin has always been willing to agree to these things. He agreed to the Minsk agreements. He agreed to he agreed to this agreement after when after Russia had invaded for Russia to get out. He, he agreed with all these things. Will he agree with with this with Russia on the offensive? Maybe not, but it would be a wise thing for Ukraine right now to challenge them to do so, <laughs> and put the onus on Russia. Right now, the U.S. and Ukraine refuse completely the idea of negotiations. And this is a disaster. It will be a disaster for Ukraine. It'll be a disaster for the world as the danger of nuclear war will continue to hang over our heads. So I'd ask everyone to please consider joining this campaign. If you think, whatever your perspective, if you think the only solution now is to have a ceasefire and negotiations to see what parts of independence Ukraine can still hold on to and to stop the slaughter that's going on. We haven't seen this type of trench warfare since World War I. So thank you. I hope you'll consider that and uh, go down with some questions. Thank you so much to our three speakers. Um, <clears throat> we're moving into uh, a time of about 15 minutes, about five minutes each. And that's that's my role is to be timekeeper um, and you will be asking questions. Uh, so I think if you divide that up uh, by five minutes each, uh, where you are the question asker and um, you can have that time for yourself. So, so maybe starting um, with Joseph Gerson and um, moving to George Beebe and then um, Paul Shannon for the last five minutes. During this time, we have our five students from the Amnesty Club who will be uh, looking out at you to raise hands if you have questions. They'll bring you a form. 
And I'd also like to introduce Shannon and Scarlett, who are members of the Amnesty Club, who are also here to help. And um, and we will be collecting those questions um, and screening them and um, presenting them to you uh, for the final portion of the evening. Okay. All right. Um, I am going to also. Um, you, you know, I think if you stay there and then I'm going to um, unpin myself and um, or this room. Thank you. Oh, um, yes, I suppose I could do that or or you could come here and I could share the screen. Why don't we do that? So I want to make a few comments as part of my as part of my questions here. Um, first of all, I do want to uh, say that in conversations with um, in the track two sessions, people have been quite clear uh, that General Austin, who's our top military guy, uh, has said that the goal of the United States has been strategic defeat of Russia. Uh, that's still the policy of the U.S. military in this situation. We need to face that. And in that context, it makes negotiations difficult. Uh, I don't fully agree with Paul in terms of his reading of, of the Russians. Uh, when I and I, I guess I'd like both him and, uh, and 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 George to respond. When I was my first, actually the second sentence out of my professor of international relations at Georgetown was that the study of international relations is analogous to studying the rules of the game among mafia families, uh, and I think that the Russians. I've not exactly been entirely um, benign uh, in their approach, and we do remember need to remember that in 1914, or rather 2014, um, you know, we we had the little green men, uh, the Wagner Brigade, uh, and um, you know, using using proxies in the crisis to advance what Putin perceived as his as his uh, uh, ambitions. So I would I would ask for comment on that. Uh, I would. Um, Ask, I guess I've got to ask George if he's heard anything to this effect. Um, but as we've heard, you know, there were negotiations uh, that were apparently completed uh, in uh, March of uh, 2022 in Istanbul. Uh, and it's been reported that at that point, uh, the Ukraine agreed to neutrality. Uh, and it was a combination, as Paul was indicating, that the United States and Britain, uh, who um, uh, basically lay down the law. I'd be curious what might be known in terms of the Istanbul uh, Treaty. Uh, I also want to, um, I guess I want to take advantage here uh, and uh, talk a little bit about Crimea, um, two levels. Uh, one is in the uh, track two process. Um, I've heard very senior Russians say uh, that if it looks like Ukraine is going to actually seize control of Crimea, all bets are off in terms of Russian use of tactical nuclear weapons. And I guess I would like to ask, uh, I guess I'll ask George this in terms of what he's hearing in relationship to Zelensky's continued ambitions to take Crimea. Uh, I will say that uh, early on, I was in an off the record uh, meeting uh, with one of the most senior Democratic members uh, of the House of Representatives, uh, during which he said, of course, this was off the record, so I'm not going to name him. Uh, he said he was willing to risk nuclear war in order to ensure um, uh, Ukrainian access and control of Crimea. Uh, to what extent do you think that this remains the um, condition? I guess the last thing, maybe a corrective for, for Paul, um, in in the um, uh, negotiations about um, uh, 
NATO and uh, its, its future, it really took place in the context of, of negotiations over German reunification. Uh, and my understanding of the uh, what was agreed uh, was that uh, there was actually two levels of discussion here. First, James Baker, who was Secretary of State uh, in negotiations with Gorbachev's people, uh, opened up the, the possibility, basically said the United States uh, will make a commitment uh, not to extend NATO uh, a centimeter or an inch closer to Moscow, uh, but we won't put NATO forces in, in East Germany. Uh, and that was, that was spoken. Uh, but when it came time to sign the agreement, uh, Bush had said no. Uh, he wouldn't accept that. Uh, uh, he would not make the commitment. And Gorbachev, in his um, memoirs later, uh, in his speeches, said that one of his great regrets, one of his mistakes, was to have gotten that commitment in writing. But nonetheless, in writing or otherwise, it was a fundamental mistake for the U.S. to extend NATO uh, in, in that direction. Uh, I guess maybe I'll ask whoever wants to do it. I, I, could, I, I, would, I would do it, but I don't have the opportunity here uh, to, to talk about the impacts of the war uh, on Asia, especially in relationship to Taiwan. Uh, we need to keep eye on that. Maybe we have to move on to the next questions. So maybe we're just holding these questions um, unless we would like to change the format. Um, and you, you're the last, you tell us which way to go. So why don't we have uh, the other speakers answer Joe's questions and then move to the audience questions. Okay. We'll do that unless somebody has a pressing question that they want to ask. So, well, I, I have a question. I'll try to do a quick answer. Okay. And then we can move to you, George. Okay. Um, I'm not uh, the Wagner mercenaries. I assume we're talking about Eastern Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as I understand it, the uh, in 2014, with the repression going on by the really kind of ultra right wing forces that took over Ukraine at that time, this all would change later with Zelensky and all that type of thing. But uh, that those people were going to be on the receiving end of massive repression, especially once the anti-terrorist operation was declared to wipe them out. My understanding is that, that those rebellions in Donetsk and Luhansk were originally indigenous. Uh, and the people in that area who are citizens of Ukraine at the time <laughs> um, were rising up because the election had just been stolen from them, that everyone had agreed was a fair election, and that uh, now they were not being allowed to uh, use their, their own language. And they had all these crazy people coming at them saying that uh, Russians are inferior beasts who have to be wiped out. Um, Russia then comes in as the Ukraine government, again, I may have the sequence wrong, as the Ukraine government conducts this uh, operation and Russia comes in to protect those originally indigenous independent republics, does not recognize them, continues to recognize Ukraine at that point as the government of that area, but insists on autonomy for those areas. So anyway, that's, that's my understanding of it. And uh, certainly Putin took that commitment in 20, in, uh, 2000, in 1990 that was made seriously. So then in 2007, when he, you know, when he uh, gives his talk against what, uh, what Russia is, what uh, the West is doing, uh, well, he gives a great, he gives quite a long talk. And he says, you have broken the agreement you made with us that you would not expand to the West whether that was wishful thinking, but it was pretty clear that, that that type of verbal agreement had been made and that Russia was clearly under the impression that by disbanding the Warsaw Pact and allowing NATO to take over all of Germany instead of just West Germany, uh, that there would be no expansion, which then happened within a year. <laughs> Even when Russia was at its weakest under Yeltsin. Can I ask a question now?
Well, I'm, well, I'm up here at the same time. You got the mic. <laughs> uh, I'd ask both both George and Joe. Can you just speak it into the microphone? I would ask both George and Joe. Um, what elements do you see is necessary uh, in the negotiations uh, to have a prayer of those negotiations working? What would be the key elements that, that should go into those negotiations, in your opinion? Okay. Um, well, let me start with some of the questions that Joe has raised. Um, I think he is suggesting that um, the uh, the notion that um, this war began almost entirely because of U.S. mistakes um, and that Russia, you know, bears little responsibility for what happened is it does not accord with Joe's perceptions of what went on. And, and I think I think, look, to, um, I largely agree with what Paul has sketched out. Uh, about the mistakes that the West has made over you know many decades since the end of the Cold War, that essentially foreclosed um, an alternative uh, to uh, NATO becoming Europe's uh, sole security arm, uh, something that the Russians uh, uh, always feared and, and quite clearly objected to. There were alternatives to that. The United States uh, ultimately proved not to be open to considering those alternatives. I think that was a major strategic mistake. Um, and you know, is one of the principal reasons why we're in the situation we're in right now. That said, the Russians made some mistakes too. Um, unsurprisingly, in, in many ways, the Russians were their own worst enemy. Um, they tended to be overly aggressive uh, in their approaches to their neighbors. Um, and that uh, overly aggressive approach which didn't always involve the use of military force, but involved a lot of threat and intimidation and coercion, stoked uh, fears in Russia's neighbors, you know, which, you know, all of which had a very painful history with Moscow. Um, it it uh, reinforced their desire to seek protection from the West. Um, and the more they did seek protection from the West, the more Russia's fears grew. Um, and you know the the thing that the Russians should have done was approach their neighbors in um, a more benign and understanding way, seeking win-win solutions, and not automatically assuming that a desire for democracy and a desire for good relations with the West meant necessarily an anti-Russian approach and uh, less security for the Russians. So, um, you know, that indivisibility of security, uh, which Joe mentioned is a, a foundational principle um, in the, uh, you know, the Helsinki Accords, which were signed during the Cold War in the Paris Charter signed at the, uh, in the, the waning years of the Cold War. Um, the Russians, I think, uh, did as much damage to that principle as the United States did. So I think there's blame on both sides. We ended up in an action reaction cycle that has intensified over time. Um, now, uh, this question of were negotiations more or less completed in uh, March uh, and, and April of 2022, um, in the weeks after the initial Russian invasion. Well, I think there's no question that Russian diplomats and Ukrainian diplomats made some significant progress in narrowing down what uh, a settlement would look like. Um, they passed many drafts of uh, 
treaties back and forth agreed on several points, one of which was that Ukraine would be geopolitically neutral. It would not be a member of either the NATO alliance or, or any Russian associated alliance. Um, and they agreed that Ukraine would have limits on the military forces it could hold and house on its territory. Um, there were further discussions about uh, rights for Russian speakers in the country. Um, but uh, as far as I can tell, and I, I think I will acknowledge that there are aspects of what went on and what was agreed to that we still don't know, or at least have not been made public, um, I don't think they were on the brink of signing a fully completed treaty. They had made progress, they had narrowed down some issues, but there were still some significant gaps between them. Um, and that means there was still a lot of work to be done to, to find the basis for a lasting settlement. And Russia's demands have probably you know, intensified uh, since that time uh, because of all of the blood and treasure that has been expended in this war in the, uh, in the last almost two years since then. Um, on the question of uh, Crimea and, and nuclear use, um, I think there's no question uh, in my mind, and I've not found a Russian that feels any differently, that um, you, you, uh, the prospect that Ukraine would actually take Crimea or cut off Russian access to Crimea in some significant way is uh, something that would trigger Russian escalation. Uh, militarily. Would they escalate immediately to use of nuclear weapons of some kind? My guess is probably not. Uh, that's, of course, an extremely risky thing to do. Could easily escalate into you know, strategic nuclear exchanges between the United States and Russia. Neither side would prevail in a situation like that. So I'm, I'm sure the Russians will not be quick to resort to that as a, as a first step. Um, but there are many things that the Russians could do to escalate against uh, the United States and NATO if the loss of Crimea uh, appeared imminent. Um, and that would probably result in direct military exchanges between Russia and NATO or the United States. Once that happened, um, it becomes much more difficult to control that escalation. There's much more at stake. The levels of trust between Russia and the United States are already at rock bottom. And in a situation like that, both sides could be prone to worst case assessments of what the other might be doing. And, you know, pretty uh, itchy trigger fingers when it comes to you know, preempting rather than waiting for what might be coming from the other side. That would be a very explosive situation and, and one that I think the United States should steer well clear of. Um, on, uh, on the question of what elements are needed for a, a successful uh, settlement, well, I think one element is, is very clear. Uh, Ukraine is going to have to be geopolitically neutral. Um, and that means not just that Ukraine forswear uh, membership in NATO, but the United States is going to have to say, you know, we, we're not going to seek Ukrainian membership in the alliance. Uh, and we're going to have to put that in writing because the Russians no longer trust us. You know, they've they've been burned uh, from their point of view several times um, and they're not going to uh, make what they believe would be a mistake of simply uh, accepting a, a handshake from the United States on this. They want something on paper that's legally binding. So that's going to be a, a have to be a part of this. Um, there's going to have to be some agreements on um, arms control, um, restrictions similar to what was put in the now uh, defunct conventional forces uh, in Europe uh, treaty that would have caps on 
um, the numbers and types of weapons Ukraine can have on its territory. And the Russians, I think, are going to have to reciprocate in some way, accepting some caps on the numbers and types of weapons they can put uh, on Russian territory near Ukraine. Um, that's going to be an extremely difficult negotiation, um, but one that ultimately will have to be a part of any kind of a settlement agreement. Um, there's going to have to be some understandings on reconstruction, um, and there's going to have to be Russian acknowledgement that uh, a militarily neutral Ukraine um, still has um, the freedom to seek economic associations with other states, including uh, seeking membership in the European Union. Um, and then uh, there are going to be some very thorny things that are going to have to be addressed, and they're going to take a long time. And I don't think they're prerequisites for uh, an armistice, for ending the active phase of hostilities between uh, Russia and Ukraine, but will we'll have to be hashed out over time in order to reach a long-term uh, treaty settlement. That includes where are the borders drawn up between uh, Russia and Ukraine. That's not something that Ukraine can talk about right now. The United States certainly shouldn't be negotiating borders uh, uh, over Ukraine's heads. Um, and yet Russia is not going to agree to give up territory that it now holds on the battlefield. So um, that's going to have to be an issue that I think is put on the table for resolution over an extended period of time. And that's uh, the, the approach that the, the Russian and Ukrainian negotiators took in, in March and April of 2022. They, they included a provision where you know, the status of Crimea and other Russian occupied uh, territory would be um, put on hold for 10 or 15 years, you know, after which you know, the negotiators might be in a position to uh, to forge some sort of an understanding there, but that's not a that's not a situation that's ripe for uh, negotiation right now. They're also going to have to deal with the reconstruction. They're going to have to deal with exchange of prisoners, with war crimes, reparations, all those sorts of things. Those are important, but they're not fundamental to ending the fighting right now. Um, the key to ending the fighting right now is, you know, that question of Ukrainian neutrality, the question of military holdings, disengagement, um, putting in place some confidence building measures that can monitor uh, cessation of hostilities and that sort of thing. Those are all very, very difficult to do. The, uh, the odds right now are, are long against doing that sort of thing. But the alternative, I think, is much, much worse. So it's something the United States needs to be pursuing. Thank you so much. So we're hearing a lot of expert analysis and um, we've gotten the questions. Thank you very much. Um, and what I'd like to do, most of these questions are put out to all three of you. So I would like to um, begin with a two part question. That is really speaking, it, I believe it comes from one of our students. They didn't identify themselves, um, but after hearing all of this, um, again, expert um, opinion and analysis, um, this is, seems to be a question that is really asking you to speak from your heart, very fundamentally, two parts. This first part comes from the student, and I'm gonna give each of you two minutes to answer these questions, okay? Do you believe the US should be involved in this type of foreign conflict or any conflict at all? That's the first part. And the second part comes from Louis. What can US citizens do to work toward a ceasefire in Ukraine and Russia? What can US citizens, this group of people here, do? So, um, and then if you're here, you can come up to the podium. Yes, yeah, so why don't we Joseph? Two minutes.
So during the Vietnam War, um, there were uh, older people at the time who said, you know, the Vietnam War is um, not unique. Um, it comes out of a long history. Uh, and so for most of my life, I will say until the um, Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, I was pretty close to being an absolute pacifist. Uh, you know, if you look at the United States wars and where it's been, it's been an imperial project since 1898. Uh, and um, uh, awful lot of people, awful lot of opportunities have been sacrificed for that. Um, but I, I will say that I do respect people's right to self-defense, nation's right to self-defense, uh, uh, but we have to be extraordinarily careful about that. Um, so there's my answer on that. In terms of what citizens can do, uh, you know, just a whole variety of things. Uh, you know, the, the easiest thing to do is to be writing to members of Congress, uh, to be uh, going to their offices to meet with them, to tell them we want to change. Uh, you know, it, it can um, move to joining demonstrations, organizing them. The uh, first thing to do is simply to begin talking with people. I mean, at the base is is to be bringing people together to talk about what the situation is. Uh, what do people really believe? What is it that we can do? Uh, you know, um, one of the one of the efforts uh, that actually uh, played a major role in preventing uh, President Nixon from using nuclear weapons uh, against Vietnam uh, was a massive student strike uh, called the moratorium. Uh, and a lot of actions led up to that uh, the vigil, uh, just beginning, raising some controversy, getting debate going, uh, uh, holding teach-ins. I mean, the range is huge. Uh, one thing you might do would be, I'm blanking on a name right now, um, uh, I'm going to blank on it. But there's a whole variety of, of tools that are there. When I was organizing the Vietnam, the Vietnam War, the leader of the clergy and lady concerned about Vietnam said, look, there's 38, 38 arrows in our quiver. Uh, the question is to figure which one to use when. Uh, one thing you can do is just to do a study of what kinds of things students and others have done in the past uh, and then decide which ones make the most sense to you. Well, start, let me start with the last one. Otherwise, I go over two minutes. I know that. Um, whatever you think of this situation, if you have come to the conclusion that negotiations is a path to avoid catastrophe, particularly for Ukraine right now, but possibly for all of us if this thing keeps going and the U.S. and Russia get into it, this war has to end, and it has to end now. It can only end through negotiations, as all wars usually do. And so I would invite people to join us, of course. I put some uh, sign-up sheets over on the table. But to just consider whether you want to be part of this Ukraine a time for peace uh, campaign. Uh, what's going on there is such a tragedy. Uh, just think of what it would be, what a great thing it would be someday for Russians and Ukrainians who have fought each other so hard. Just look at the, the fight that the Ukrainians are putting up and the Russians for them to, at some point in the not too distant future, to say, wow, we really fought each other hard and it's now time for reconciliation. That is far off. <laughs> right now. The hatred is too great. The destruction is too great. But that's what we're looking for. That's what happened in Vietnam. As U.S. soldiers who killed thousands of Vietnamese went back, shook hands, and started to build schools and provide special medical care for their victims. And the Vietnamese just loved it. And there's a whole new relationship that is built uh, on those types of relationships. That's where we want to go. The first step is to end the darn war. Uh, and does 
sending more, you know, another $150 billion, or I guess it's $61 billion now. Is it going to is it going to help Ukraine or is it just going to lead to more Ukrainian deaths? Is it going to deal with the real reasons that this war is fought in the first place? So I'd ask people to do that. I'd, I think having study groups, pick one of these books that Joe or I or someone else thinks is good to, to study on this. I mean, what do we all know about Ukraine? <laughs> Until two years ago, I did not know a darn thing. Maybe I don't now know it anymore. But learn about it, get involved in it, uh, talk to your friends, try to try to bring up the issue in in forums for young people to talk about it and what their thoughts are. And uh, if you think ceasefire negotiations is the way to go, get involved in that. We need people out here to get people, get postcards signed to our leaders telling them to take this path. And uh, so it just, sounds like your answer is yes to the U.S. should be involved. The U.S. No, the U.S. It should in this situation. No, my, my feeling is the U.S. should get out of the way, allow the Russians and Ukrainians to. Uh, I, I, this should have been the case. This should have been the case from the beginning. The U.S. Of course, we want the U.S. to be involved in the world in a positive way. But if you look at I mean, this, what is what is our foreign policy really based on? Is it based on welfare of Ukrainians? Really? I mean, look at these guys that run the country. Look what they say. Look what they're about. Is that what you're about? That's why we don't want the U.S. to be involved because of what it of what it leads to. And the U.S. isn't the only country doing that type of thing in the world, but it's the most powerful. And it, whether you want to look at Iraq, whether you want to look at Afghanistan, Vietnam, whether you want to look at almost 200 invasions of other countries in our short history. No other country has invaded other countries as much as we have. These are things we have to know and we have to ask, have to ask what is our goal, whether it's Ukraine, Iraq, whatever. What are we trying to achieve? And is what we're trying to achieve something that I believe in? Or does it contradict what I believe in? In which case we have to organize to oppose it. Thank you. Okay, a few short points. These are excellent questions. Um, number one, the United States needs to distinguish um, the difference between things that are vital to the United States and things that are merely nice to do in principle. Um, and we've not done a very good job over the past three decades since the end of the Cold War of making that distinction. Um, there were no other countries in the world for most of that period that could come close to American military and economic power. And as a result, we thought we could basically do whatever we wanted in the world. And other countries really didn't have an alternative uh, to uh, our will. Um, and we got involved in wars that were um, not vital to the United States. And by vital, I mean things that actually threaten the existence of the country, the, the security of our people, our ability to be a, a thriving uh, and free nation. Um, those sorts of vital interests are not at stake for the United States and Ukraine, despite the rhetoric that you'll hear coming out of Washington, that you know, the entire world order and the fate of democracy in the world and the fate of democracy in the United States are all at stake in Ukraine. That's simply an exaggeration. Um, Ukraine uh, has been under Moscow's rule for almost the entire time that the United States has been an independent nation. Um, and that, you know, didn't affect our, our country's security or prosperity one iota, I would say. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the fact that you know, the United States thinks it is obligated to defend democracy or countries that we believe are our allies all over the world is not vital to the United States security and prosperity. Um, so, you know, should the United States be involved in the world? Absolutely, yes, we have to be. 
Um, the country's security does depend on things like freedom of navigation in the world. The United States is a trading nation. You know, we're, we're you know, uh, an air power and a sea power, our prosperity and security depend on our ability to defend the sea approaches and air approaches to the country to, to deter use of nuclear weapons and all of that. So, you know, we have to be involved in the world. But, you know, do we have to go to war, you know, to make sure the Middle East is is free or make sure that Ukraine is democratic or whatever other justification of the day is out there? No, we can uh, make sure that no other power has sufficient capability to threaten us. Um, with measures far short of going to war in most cases. We can establish um, a, a balance of forces in the world that allow the United States to prosper um, and be free and democratic. Um, that's what I think is, is meant by making you know, the world safe for democracy, safe for the United States to, to be secure and prosperous internally. Um, what can U.S. citizens do? Well, you know, um, Washington does respond to popular opinion. I mean, Congress is very attuned to all this, and, and the White House is as well. Um, Washington has grown more and more divorced from, you know, ordinary Americans and their interests over the past several decades, true, but they're not entirely uh, immune to popular opinion. Um, and so, you know, reaching out to your, your representatives in Washington, local initiatives, uh, peace marches and rallies and all of these things, they are noticed in Washington. They do uh, act as one of the forces that shape uh, American policy. So it may seem that, you know, you're, you're far away and you know, don't have a lot of influence. But um, the more of those sorts of things that happen, the more Washington takes notice and the more they take into consideration alternatives to their current course. So I would encourage citizen activism on this. Great, thank you very much. So I'm going to now uh, direct questions to individuals and give you again just two minutes to answer and there'll be three uh more questions and then um a minute or so for closing statements okay so this is going to go to joseph comes from jonathan group who is a a member of milton for peace and is really been instrumental tonight how worried should we be by claims that if russia is allowed to win by any definition it will strengthen their imperialists and lead to greater European instability. I think the way I want to answer this is to I could just make reference to the track two uh, discussions, uh, where what I'm hearing uh, is that um, Russia's conventional forces have been devastated. It may be able to do a, another a, another round of, uh, of conscription, um, but it's been profoundly weakened. Uh, the Russians are talking about the next 15 years of being devoted uh, to rebuilding their defenses. Uh, they, they see they see NATO, especially with the expansion now to Sweden and Finland, they can't defend their northern frontier. Uh, so, so I think that they're they're in no rush uh, to 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 be aggressive, uh, and I want to put this in context. I mean, Paul kind of ran through uh, a significant part of of what our real history is, uh, but we need to know it. Uh, how is it that we had so many colonies in the world? How many people were killed in the Philippines? How many people were killed in Indochina? What was that really about? And to go back and remember President Eisenhower, right? He had been the leading general 
in the Europe, the U.S. during World War II. And in his closing speech, his valedictory speech, he warned the country about the military industrial complex. Actually, the first draft of it was the military industrial congressional complex. And when you look at where is your tax dollar spent, more than half of it goes for the military. At the same time that we're facing, and, and what does that military do, right? I mean, how many wars in the Middle East? I worked closely with Daniel Ellsberg. I was privileged to do that. He had been the leading author of U.S. nuclear war policy uh, in the Kennedy administration. And, and I did the research. On more than 30 occasions during international tensions and conflicts, the United States has prepared and threatened to initiate nuclear war at least 30 times. We need, I mean, many years ago, I was just close with this. Some years ago, we did a, a, a retreat uh, focused mostly on the civil rights movement and racial justice. And one of the speakers there was Bob Moses, uh, who was one of the leading figures of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, shock troops of the civil rights movement. And a somewhat ignorant question about what we should do uh, was, was asked to him by a white guy. And Bob Moses' response was, who is we? I think it's really important that we should understand who is we? What is our country in the world? How is it perceived by others? Why is it that the global South is sitting out, not only, not only Ukraine, but the Gaza war? Because they know our history, and they've said enough. So, Paul, this, this question was directed to you. It's the only one. Um, and you spoke about negotiation. Mm -hmm. So this comes from Jane Taylor. Who is the chief or best person uh, to negotiate a peace? And who should be looking to do this negotiate, negotiation, a person or a group? Who in Ukraine is a leader and a voice for these negotiations? Two minutes. Well, the people that should negotiate right now are the representatives of the Russian government and the re representatives of the present Ukrainian government of President Zelensky, just as they did after the invasion started. I think the record is clear that those negotiations between those two forces would have had Rus Russian withdrawal from Ukraine and a peaceful outcome of an in, of a neutral and independent Ukraine. That's my belief. And so that's one level of the negotiations that have to take place. Russia and Ukraine have to solve this thing without outside interference. When NATO sends Boris Johnson, the prime minister of England, to tell Zelensky, don't you dare continue this negotiation. That's interference. <laughs> so let them negotiate. But as Joe has mentioned, there's got to be other negotiations too, because so much of this is a Russia-US thing, right? I mean, we, we're the ones who had this strategic agreement with Ukraine. We're the ones who pushed NATO expansion to, to the border. Uh, the European countries are have no courage whatsoever. They fall in line when we tell them what to do, which is pathetic. They should be ashamed of themselves. And yet that's what they do, because the, the U.S. calls the shots, and that's reality because of our immense power. So there has to be negotiations between NATO and Russia, between the U.S. and Russia. Uh, be, and ob ob obviously Ukraine has to be part of these. NATO has to be part of the negotiations between Russia and uh, and Zelensky. But the fact that uh, that they had come to an agreement where Ukraine would be a neutral country is uh, is a good sign. So what has to happen now? The negotiations that was that were stopped in March of 2022 that would have left Ukraine as an independent country except for Crimea. They have to resume. 
by the parties who conducted those negotiations then. Thank you. Uh, so for George, um, we've heard a lot of information tonight. So I thought this question might be a good one. Um, this comes from Bill Gallagher. Um, he asks, what should be a, a, a reliable source of information? Is it media or another thing? <laughs> <laughs> as we, uh, as we are live in this age of information, how do we get it and uh, put things together, know what to do? Well, um, that is an excellent question, and I, I don't have an easy answer for you. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, uh, one of the things that intelligence analysts do is, is work in, in a domain of information uncertainty. You, know, you, you popular imagination is the CIA has all of this information, all these secrets, and you know they really know what's going on because you know they've got the real stuff. You know, in fact, you know, CIA does have more information than is available to the general public. Yes, but a lot of it is contradictory. A lot of it is uncertain. You have to evaluate how reliable is this source? Does this source have an agenda? How can we be sure that this is true, et cetera, et cetera? And, and you really have to, to um, look at, at what you have available and make some hard judgments uh, about uh, what's going on. Um, and the, you bound your uncertainties, but you never eliminate them. And unfortunately, I think we're in a situation uh, in Ukraine right now where there, there are at least two wars going on. One is a, a war on the battlefield between contending armies, but the other is an information war in which multiple players are trying to gain the upper hand in shaping the perceptions of what's going on on the battlefield. And that makes it very difficult for somebody, you know, sitting here in the United States trying to understand just what the heck is really going on and what should I believe about what's true and what's not. Um, people are trying to shape narratives uh, to, to, to their own advantage in this war, and all of the players are doing it, and that <laughs> includes the United States. Um, so my only uh, advice in a situation like this is, is you have to be your own analyst in taking all this information in. Um, try to, to read uh, and watch uh, widely. Think about who is putting out the information that you're consuming. Ask about what agendas they might have. Compare the claims that you're, you're reading and seeing to you know, what you might expect uh, that per, you know, particular source to be advancing in all of this. Um, and, you know, um, it's hard for people without a lot of expertise or experience in this area to, to know what to think. But, um, you know, I, I can't point you to, to a source and say, ah, ha, ha, if you, if you only listen to these guys over here, you'll get the straight scoop. Um, unfortunately, I, I can't give you that, you know, kind of advice. You're, you're going to have to um, read and listen critically and, and think hard about what makes sense to you going forward in all of this. Thank you so much. So in our uh, in your closing remarks, I'm, we're coming up on time, so really succinct. I'm just going to give you a minute. <laughs> Um, and just, just, uh, <laughs> you did great there with the two minutes. Um, so, um, yes, why don't we have Joseph? So there's one thing that I, I really neglected to say, and I think has been missing. 
what should we do? We should be demanding stop the killing. Uh, one of the people that, that uh, Paul and I've been privileged to work with is a woman named Ann Wright. She's a colonel in the military. She was a diplomat. She resigned over the invasion of Iraq. And in a conference in Vienna uh, last year, uh, she said, you know, in order to get to the Korean armistice, there were 500 meetings to get to the armistice agreement. Uh, we need to begin those meetings now. Uh, we can move to have a ceasefire. Uh, it, could, it could be along the lines of uh, what happened with the Korean armistice, which is still stopping the killing, but we never got to the peace agreement. But stop the killing now, begin the negotiations, begin the discussions, stop the killing, use diplomacy. That's what we have to do now. Well, I think this advice from George is to read everything you can, talk to people, and make your own analysis ultimately. Ultimately, we have to decide on what perspective makes sense. I think we can do that. Uh, we're smart people. <laughs> we can do that. And that's our responsibility as citizens. In terms of what to do now, I would like to focus on the fact, if you come to the belief that negotiations and the ceasefire are appropriate. On, on uh, February 24th, Massachusetts Peace Action is having a rally in downtown Boston, downtown Crossing, in which we're taking the theme of ceasefire in Gaza and in Ukraine and trying to bring them together. A lot of people are calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. Certainly, Mass Peace Action is. It's our main thing we're working on right now. And you see all so many people pushing for this of all kinds of different perspectives on the on the uh, situation. And that's uh, that's great. And we're hoping to take that belief in the ceasefire there, transfer it over to Ukraine and say we need two ceasefires, one in Ukraine and one Gaza ceasefire and negotiations. If you come to a conclusion that that is the way to go in Ukraine that that is the way to go in Gaza. Please come on September 24th, uh, February 24th, the second anniversary of the Ukraine war. We'd love to see you there. Uh, please let us know if you need any contact information. Just go to the Mass Peace Action website and it's all, there'll be all kinds of information on it. On February 15th, in preparation for that, we're doing an online teach-in with uh, Medea Benjamin, and uh, the writer for The Globe, Stephen Kinzer, and um, uh, Dennis Kucinich, right, uh, and, and probably one or two others. Again, the speakers will be talking about both Gaza and Ukraine, uh, since those are the big things in front of us right now. There's a million other really important things. A lot of people are suffering in a lot of different ways. A lot of good things are going on, too. But those are the things we have to solve, and we have to solve them now before absolute catastrophe happens. Thank you. What time downtown One o'clock downtown crossing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I will leave you with, with just one thought. Do any of you think that the United States ought to go to war with Russia to defend Ukraine. The reason why I ask is because right now that is the official position of the United States government, that the United States ought to commit itself by treaty to defend Ukraine should it be invaded by Russia. And we insist as a government that we will not back down from that position. And yet we haven't. We didn't go to war in 2014 to defend Ukraine when Russian backed forces in Crimea, in Crimea and in the Donbass were, were posing a threat to Ukraine. 
We didn't go to war in 2022 when Russia launched a large scale invasion of Ukraine. And yet our policy position is that we should and that we refuse to back down from that position. Does that make sense to you? If it does, great. If it doesn't, you should make your opinions heard on this because many of you might ultimately be committed to that kind of war. The United States can't fight a war with Russia with a volunteer force. We don't have the numbers. We would have to have a draft. And many of you, I'm sure, are of an age where you might very well be a part of that draft. Does that make sense to you? Think about that as you consider what you do moving forward. Well, thank you. Um, first, I want to thank the community for coming out on this cold uh, winter night and um, open hearts to all of this information and differing opinions. This is how we do it. Uh, secondly, I'd like to say thank you to the Amnesty Club students who <laughs> we're so excited to have. This is the world you're inheriting. And uh, I wish I was in Amnesty when I was in high school. Uh, this is There's a lot of information and it's uh, a lifetime of sorting through it. Um, and I wanted to say thank you. I think he, he may have had to leave, but to your advisor, Mr. Devlin, who shared that he has been a part of Amnesty since he was a student in high school. So um, he is leading, leading, and you always need that, that leadership and um, please pass along the thank you. Um, I'd also like to say, thank Milton for Peace for making this all possible tonight. And there is a sign up sheet again there is a um, donation bucket um, to support future endeavors. And we always like to have food. You know, there's no food here tonight, so they're out of money. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. Um, so um, last but not least, I'd like to thank our three presenters. presenters. <laughs> Speakers. For so generously sharing your expertise. You've given us a lot to think about and most importantly, encouragement to engage in our democracy. Uh, we're doing that here tonight, but we can continue to do it by, by joining up with Milton for Peace and um, uh, these rallies coming up. There's lots of ways that we can, as citizens, be a part and, and play a role in achieving peace. So thank you so much for coming tonight and uh, please sign up, please donate. Okay, let's keep the conversation going. <laughs>